We are in our study on minor prophets called the prophets of doom. Why? Because the minor prophets are not a happy-go-lucky kind of message. It's not one where it makes us feel all warm and fuzzy about being Christians and followers of God. It's actually a message uh, throughout the minor prophets of one that is of uh, impending doom. But somehow these guys talk about the end of or the judgment of something. <coughs> and they talk about it with such, um, such a focus on God that it actually ends up bringing hope. And as we learn, the minor prophets are not called minor because they're less in value. It's called, they're minor prophets because they are shorter books in the Bible. As a matter of fact, all 12 of the minor prophets were all written on one scroll in the Jewish tradition. And they were passed around to all the different churches. And I'm going to ask right now that you just forgive me. I had a little bit of a head cold this week. And so I have a lingering cough that just kind of, the irritating, so... Nothing contagious. I've already tested everything and I'm, I'm clear and I wear my mask. You see me wear my mask. But just for the interruption of today's service, I'm going to have coughing fits. I'm, I could already tell. So uh, open your Bibles to Micah. <coughs> We're reading Micah and it's again another short book in the Bible in the Old Testament. If you don't know where Micah is at in the, in the Bible... I suggest you start with the index, the table of contents in your Bible, and it shows you where Micah is at in your Bible. Uh, mine, it's on page 838, so I don't know how that helps you, but that's how it works in mine. And we're going to read a short passage here that kind of sums up all seven chapters of Micah but then we're going to kind of do an overview. We're going to kind of go through it really quickly and see the big picture of what Micah is all about. And so, if you would, Micah chapter 2, we're going to read verses 3 through 5 to begin with. Micah says, Therefore the Lord says, I am now planning a disaster against this nation. You cannot free your necks from it, then you will not walk so proudly because it will be an evil time. In that day, one will take up a taunt against you and lament mournfully, saying that we are totally ruined. He measures out an allotted land of my people and he removes it from me. He allotted our fields to traitors and therefore... There will be no one in the assembly of the Lord to divide the land by casting lots. Micah is a seldom read book and often misunderstood. Prophet to God, especially to Judah, which is the southern kingdom in Israel, the southern half of the kingdom, I should say, and so Micah was specifically to that southern part, and he had a message. And, and his message was, there is coming a disaster against this nation. And it talks about some very painful stuff in there, that, uh, that they will be given their land away, that they're going to be given away all their fields and all their crops to traitors and invaders. And, and all this is because of the message of God to the people of Israel, the people of Judah. And so let me give you a quick, uh, a flyby is what they call it, the overview. God appears to judge Israel for their sins. What sin specifically? The sin of favoritism to the wealthy and corruption of its leaders. That is a violation of God's law in the Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible. Uh, and it's a, it's a direct violation of many of the things that God established for his people to live by. For one, their leaders were supposed to be above reproach. And 
Judah's is, uh, leaders became corrupted and greedy. Their prophets were supposed to be separate from the uh, government and they were supposed to declare God's word independently. But yet the prophets of the nation actually became paid henchmen for the government. Of course, this doesn't sound familiar to us at all because we don't experience anything like that today. If you know anything about Micah, it's probably because you know two verses out of the, all seven chapters in Micah. The first one is Micah 5, 2. We know this one because uh, in just a few uh, weeks, we're going to make this a regular part of our reading because it's a part of the Christmas story. Uh, Micah 5, 2 says, Bethlehem, Euphrata, you are small among the clans of Judah. You will, one will come from you to be the ruler over Israel for me. His origin is from antiquity and from ancient times. We know this to be a messianic prophecy, the prophecy of where Jesus, the Messiah, is to be born in Bethlehem of Judea. And so we read this and we actually know it in Matthew chapter 2, the uh, scribes and, and uh, the Pharisees actually quote it to King Herod when he asks, where is this new leader of Israel supposed to be born? And so we know Micah 5.2 and we know Micah 6.8, of course. Uh, there actually was an old praise song that sang this verse. And it is, uh, but here's what it is. I'm not going to sing it to you because first of all, with the head cold, second of all, you don't really want me singing. So, but Micah 6, 8 says, mankind, he has told you what is good and what the Lord requires of you to act justly, to love faithfulness and to walk humbly with your God. I love the translations who say to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. There are three things that summarize basically all the Old Testament commandments into these very simple principles because walking by faith, having a relationship with God is not one that is going to be a uh, formula type of thing. We cannot go through and I can say, oh, if you do this, this, and this, you're going to have a good relationship with God. What I can do is I can say, here's what God says, but it all is about your heart. And so we know a lot of Micah because of those two verses, but we really don't know the overall concept or what his message really is because very few people study this book. Um, unless you go through and do a uh, purposeful study on the books of the Bible and go through all of it. I obviously, in all my education to be a pastor, I had to go through different Bible survey classes. And so we have to go over this, but I think we spent about an hour on Micah. That's it. And there's so much in Micah that you could spend quite a while on it actually. But Micah is a warning to the nation of Judah and really, it's a warning to all of us today. But just like many warning labels, we don't pay attention to a lot of it. I found some very interesting warning labels that I decided I'm going to share with you today. For instance, on a drill, we have this product is not used for dental drills. Obviously. I, I would hate to see the person who actually talks about or uh, tried to decide that that was going to be a dental drill. This one was on a dog's medication. May cause drowsiness when uh, used care when operating a car. I don't know about you, but my dog doesn't even have a learner's permit, so I'm not letting him drive even when he's on medication. So why do we need to worry about a dog driving a car? Then we have this one. This is one of my favorites. Use like regular soap. It is a bar of soap. I don't know what the difference is. How do you use it differently? I mean, my aunt and uncle tried to use it at, to clean out my mouth when I said a bad word, but... 
Then we have this one for all you fishermen. Just in case you weren't aware, don't swallow a hook because it's harmful. I, I, I kind of thought, and then there's this one. I'm sorry, it's just kind of, why do we need warning labels on things like this? I mean, these are common sense stuff, right? Well, Micah is the same way. As you read through Micah, and, and as I kind of uh, give you four lessons in Micah briefly, there are things that you're going to see that it's kind of like, duh, these are obvious, but yet, just like with warning labels, they may be obvious, but we need to have a reminder because we're prone to doing some of these things naturally and making these mistakes and, and doing things that are not the wisest use of our intelligence. And so, just to dive in, let's kind of go through, and I'm going to show you four lessons that are actually in Micah that kind of go together to give you the main message of Micah. Uh, the first one is, there is an inherent danger to sin. There is a danger to sin. Micah chapter 2, starting in verse 1, says, Woe to those who dream up wickedness and prepare evil plans on their beds. As morning light, they will accomplish it because it is the power is in your, their hands to do so. And so again, this is the, the prophecy that Micah was talking about that because of the sin of the leaders and because of the sins of the prophets, Judah is going to go under a judgment. And this judgment is because of their sin. Well, their sin was also because a lot of those leaders and prophets and even some of the, the everyday common man began to plot evil, to plan out their sins. There are actually two types of sins that the Bible talks about. Sins of omission and sins of premeditation. Now, sins of omissions are ones that you don't know are a sin, but you kind of fall into them. You don't realize that you are sinning. And so God, through his Holy Spirit and through his word, through the scripture, have to reveal that sin to you so that you can repent of it, so you can ask for forgiveness. But it's not one that you purposely went out and said, God, I'm going to sin against you right now by doing this. But sins of premeditation are the sins that we know we are doing. And Hebrew talks about that there are sins that easily ensnare us. There are to use a common uh, kind of loose translation of it, there are sins that are our favorite sins. We all have favorite sins. Some people have the favorite sin of lying. We actually knew some people that it was just who they were. They lied. Even if you knew the truth and you had all the evidence right in front of them, they would still lie to you. Because they don't know to do anything different. They just lie. There are sins, that there are plenty of sins that we all commit and we all have favorites. But there is a danger to sin. The people of Judah kind of went to God and says, well, you know, I can do what I want. I can sin against God. By the way, let me remind you what a sin is. A sin is any offense or breaking of the law from God. Any word, action, or thought that goes against the holiness of God. And so we all have sinned. That's in scripture. There is plenty of it. Pastor Earl was good to remind us of all of it. I was afraid he was going to start listing my sins in the worship service. Got real nervous. We kind of... We don't need convincing that we are all sinners. We kind of know that we have sinned against God. But we need to understand that there's a danger to sin. See, when Judah said, I can do what I want, God is going to forgive me anyways, that's the wrong attitude. And that's what led them to this compromising of standards 
that got them into the trouble in the first place. And so there is an inherent danger to sin, especially the premeditated type. And it is taking advantage of God's grace. And God's not good. God's not okay with people taking advantage of him. Now, God is a very gracious and merciful God. But to take advantage of that is wrong. It kind of goes back to the, you know, uh, the, the just the common sense kind of saying, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. You know, God understands that we are going to be constantly sinning against him and he is faithful to forgive us if we confess our sins and come to him for forgiveness. First John 1 John 1.9 talks about that. But if we are purposely just saying, I'm going to go out and sin because God has grace and his grace, man, I can take care of this later. That's not in a good standing with God. And there's a danger to that. Romans chapter 6 puts it this way. Paul writes, Should I keep sinning so that God's grace may abound? The absolutely not! Paul, in his writings, uh, uh, you know how, how when you read a text, you can't understand the, the emotions behind it necessarily? And so they came up with these little symbols to try to convey the emotion of whether or not someone's laughing or someone's serious about something. Well, we can't understand the emotions with text except for you can hear Paul's tone in this one. Absolutely not. And in ancient writings, when you, when you write something like two or three times, it's emphasizing it. It's bringing uh, uh, importance to the saying. This was written twice in the original text. Absolutely not. Don't keep sinning just so that God can forgive you of more things. I've talked to many people who, they get saved at a very young age. They're, they're saved and, and they live a Christian life. And then we talk about sharing our testimonies and a lot of Christians, young Christians, or people who were saved at a very young age are kind of uh, nervous about sharing their testimony because they didn't get to do a lot of sinning before they were saved. Well, I didn't go and drink and I wasn't a part of the bar scene and I didn't go around sleeping with other people and I just don't have a very good testimony. Are you kidding? You are still saved by grace. That is all you need. So whether you have one of those that you were saved out of the, basically the grasp of hell and you were rescued and turned into a Christian who is faithfully following God or if you were saved at an early age and protected from all that, you are still saved by grace. And it is a great testimony. But getting back to the point of Micah, he's saying there's a danger to sin. One that we need to be aware of constantly. It's kind of like the, those warning labels. It's like if sin actually had a warning label, it says dangerous. This is harmful to your spiritual health. It's like, duh, we know that. But yet we still are given to sin. Micah continues on though. And he said, and because this is a message about the, the leaders of Judah and the prophets of the day, he comes and he kind of points out that speaking for God is a very serious issue. Speaking for God is serious. Let's see where that's at. Micah chapter 3 verse 5, he says, This is what the Lord says concerning the prophets who lead my people astray, who proclaim peace when they have food to sink their teeth into, but declare war against the one who puts nothing in their mouth. That sounds kind of weird. Do any of you understand that just off the top? Okay, let me help you out a little bit because I needed help too. This is basically saying that uh, the prophets of the day, the preachers, the church leaders 
would proclaim peace to all those who would pay them, who would feed them. If you give me money, I will promise you blessing. But if you don't give me money, then I'm going to declare war on you. Thus th saith the Lord, if you don't pay me good, I'm going to wage war against you. That doesn't sound very godly, does it? But basically, the prophets started living in a lifestyle to where they would compromise their message if you would pay them enough. They would change whatever they felt God was telling them to speak. And Deuteronomy actually says that woe to anyone who prophesies and it does not come true because they should be stoned to death. They should be put to death. If we took seriously anyone who gets up and says, this is what the Lord says, if we took that, that uh, cautionary tell to heart, people would get nervous about getting into a pulpit on Sunday morning. And trust me, I take it very seriously. But there are a lot of pastors and a lot of preachers and a lot of Christian leaders today who are falling into the same trap. See, Micah was addressing the ancient prosperity gospel preachers of the day. But we have a lot of those same preachers that preach to us now. Turn on the TV and what do you hear? Send in your gift of any amount and you will receive this piece of cloth that will bless you. Really? I love the one. I could tell, I, and trust me, I, I, there's a long story behind this, but when I used to hear some of them, I've tuned them out now and I don't listen to them on purpose, but there were some that I would hear that... If you send in your gift of any amount, I promise you will have a sevenfold blessing on you. Okay. You will receive seven times what you send in. From who? That preacher isn't going to give you any back. I, I saw one clip, and you'll have to look this up. But this one reporter just simply asked a question of one of these prosperity gospel preachers about how they got their riches. And just by asking that question, the prosperity gospel says, you are demon possessed, get out of here. By asking a question. Now, none of you are prosperity preachers, but let me warn you that anytime we say that God said this, God spoke to me. That God told me something. We need to take it seriously. This is not something we need to say haphazardly or just flippant. This shouldn't be a common phrase in our, our language. I'm very careful to say I have prayed over this and I feel like God is leading me this way. But I rarely say that God told me unless I can back it up and show you through multiple scriptures. Not just one, but multiple scriptures. And it needs to be confirmed through multiple ways. James talks about this, that for us, we need to be careful because blessings and cursing come out of our mouths the same mouth. And brothers and sisters, this should not be this way. We cannot say that God told me this and then sit here and badmouth the church or badmouth another Christian or badmouth the God of all creation or, or use his name in vain or there's all kinds of ways that we take our words that are precious and few and we turn them against 
the love of God. We use them against God's people and against God's purposes because we're not taking very seriously our own words. And we need to be careful because anytime we say, God told me this, it needs to be after much thoughtful prayer and con uh, counsel to make sure that we are not going off some deep end, some weird rabbit trail. The next message that, that Micah speaks to the nation of Judah is in uh, Micah 6. And basically it's that obedience is greater than sacrifice. That God wants our obedience over our sacrifice. Actually, this is a message that is throughout all of the minor prophets. That God desires obedience. God desires a relationship rather than just a sacrifice. We talked about uh, uh, Joel last week. And we talked about how that God did not desire a sacrifice. He desired a broken heart. A repentant heart. Well, Micah says the same thing. Look at Micah 6, starting in verse 6. The people of Judah said, Well, what should I bring before the Lord when I come to bow before the Most High? Should I come to Him with burnt offerings, with year-old calves? Would the Lord be pleased with a thousand rams or with ten thousand streams of oil? Should I give my firstborn for my transgressions or the offspring of my body for my own sin? And Micah's like, no, God does not want sacrifice. God is not concerned over how much you give to try to get in right standing. God's concerned about your heart and your obedience. Because the people were saying, what can I pay to appease God? How can I make this right? Micah, you're pointing out my sin, and I know the, the, the routine here. You tell me I've sinned, and I give an offering to God, and God forgives me, and I could go on with my life. And Micah is saying, that's not the heart of the gospel. That's not the heart of God. God wants a relationship of obedience rather than just a sacrifice. He doesn't care how much time or money you give to some nonprofit or to some charity or some church. Trust me, those things come when your heart is right. And I don't bother myself with knowing all those things because... I would rather talk to you about your heart and your spiritual growth. All those things about time and money and involvement and, and all that come with the right heart. I would rather have you have the right heart than to be the, the biggest giver in our church. I don't care. Because it's more important for me to have a right relationship with God. And Micah points out, he has told you what is good and what the Lord requires. But to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. You do these things and, and that's the sacrifice God wants. Again, in Romans chapter 12, Paul writes the sacrifice that God actually wants of us. Romans 12, 1, he says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. And this is your true worship. This is how you worship God, with your heart. Because when you give your heart your actions will follow. But there is a danger to sin and we need to take seriously the things that are, God speaks to us and what we say God says. 
And we need to obey God rather than just giving gifts to God. And the last thing that he says as a, as a kind of judgment on Judah is that there are consequences for your sin. There are consequences that you're going to have to address. See, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all of our sins, to wash it away with his blood, the Bible talks about. We are forgiven and made clean by God and his sacrifice. But we still have to deal with consequences. Listen, in Genesis chapter 3 is when sin entered the world. Adam and Eve broke the laws of God. And at that time, there was just one law. Don't eat from this tree. And what they do? Oh, that looks good. Let me take a bite. Kind of like I remember with our youngest one, we told her, don't touch something. And she's like, you mean this? And that's in all of us. We all have that same attitude. I know, I love the, those other ones that are like, I'm not touching it, but I'm going to get as close as I can. That means in your heart, you are touching it. But because of sin, we are under a curse. And here's what God said when Adam and Eve broke that law. He says, because of you, the ground is cursed. You will eat from it by means of painful labor all the days of your life. The entire world is under a curse because of sin. And it, the Bible talks about that it is groaning, it is aching, it is crying out in pain because of the weight of sin on this world. And there are consequences we are going to have to deal with. The things that should bring us satisfaction are no longer going to satisfy us. You would think having a good job would be enough to make you feel good about your life, but not enough. You would think having good relationships would be enough to make you feel satisfied with your life, but it's no longer good enough. You would think that looking at how you raise your kids or how you handle your finances or how you deal with things might give you satisfaction in your life, but because of sin, those don't satisfy anymore. We are under a curse, and what it means to be a blessing is now a curse because of sin. See, God intended for the work for that, us, that we have to do to be a blessing. That our relationships with each other is supposed to be a blessing. That raising children is supposed to be a blessing. That doing all these things are supposed to be a blessing under God's original plan. But because sin entered the world, we are now under the curse and all that is painful. Marriages are no longer easy. You can't just keep them going because, well, you're young and in love. You have to work at marriage. It takes a lot of work to be married for a long time, uh, even for a short time. We entered our first difficulty in marriage within the first two years. And it took us a while to get over that. The things that are supposed to be a blessing that God meant to bless us are a curse because of sin. And until we address our sin and return to God, all of our efforts for comfort, for provision, all of our efforts for satisfaction, for purpose, for meaning, all of those will never be enough. That's why he says in, in chapter 6, verse 13, he says, as a result, I begun to strike you severely, bringing desolation because of your sin. And verse 14 and 15 says, You will eat but not be satisfied. 
that I will give you over to the sword, I, that you will sow but not necessarily reap, that your olive presses will not have enough oil, that you will tread grapes but not have enough wine to drink. All of our work will not be enough because there's consequences to our sin. Now I told you that minor prophets are kind of a bummer deal. They're not a good happy-go-lucky message. But Micah ends his book, ends his uh, message to Judah on a very interesting way. At the end of chapter 7, he kind of closes with the beautiful picture of Israel being personified. Israel, he's speaking as if Israel was a person now, not just a nation. And he sees this picture of how Israel will get right with God and will, how God will restore Israel. And even though this message from Micah is a message of judgment, like I said at the beginning, there is a hope. There is encouragement here. Because Israel, at the end of chapter 7, is watching for God's judgment and God's mercy to come at the same time. That even as he begs for God to listen, he also begs God to forgive. Here's what he says, Micah chapter 7, starting in verse 18, he says, Who is a God like you? Forgiving iniquity and passing over rebellion for the remnant of his inheritance. He does not hold on to his anger forever, but he delights in faithful love. He will again have compassion on us. He will vanquish all of our iniquities and he will cast all of our sins into the depths of the sea. You will show loyalty to Jacob and faithful love to Abraham as you swore to our fathers from days long ago. He ends with this beautiful picture of hope. And there are two reasons for us today to hope. Even though we may be under the same type of judgment for the same type of sins that Judah and Israel was experiencing back in the days of Micah, there is reason to hope. The first reason is this, because of God's character. Because of who God is. God is merciful and gracious. And his mercy and grace are greater than his anger. God is slow to judgment and he is quick to forgive us. That would be a great time to say amen. amen. God's character cannot be denied or dismissed. Or ignored. And that is a reason for us to hope. Because God's character is holy and righteous and just and gracious and merciful. God is God. And then the second reason for hope is this. Because of God's promises. God reminds Judah that God will show loyalty to the house of Jacob and he will show faithful love to the children of Abraham. Those are covenants that God had made with Israel and all of its inhabitants. Every citizen of Israel. Now because of Jesus Christ, God has promised us that we are Grafted, We are a part of that promise because of his faithfulness to include all of us who accept Jesus Christ by faith. And because of that, God has promised that we will have our sin removed. And many times in the Old Testament it talks about that he will cast it to the bottom of the ocean floor. To the depths of the sea. 
You know, we haven't even been to the very bottom of the ocean yet. We've been to space, but we can't even go to the bottom of the ocean yet. Why? Because the pressure down there crushes things. And it's amazing that we have done so much to increase our technology and the capability to go anywhere in the world and even outer space. I mean, we sent a telescope into space and took great high-def pictures of stars that we have never seen before. But we can't know what's at the bottom of the ocean. That's amazing. Elsewhere, God says that he will remove our sin as far as the east is from the west. It's very interesting. The east and the west will never meet. You keep going east, you will always go east. You go west, you will always go west. God says, God promises that he's going to remove our sin because of our belief in Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. And because of God's promises, we have hope. Yes, we may see times of judgment on our nation, maybe even in our own personal lives, we may experience God's judgment because of sin. But the promise is that God will forgive us if we confess our sin. If we turn back to him, we may face a bleak or uncertain future because of our sin. And our sin has corrupted our nation. Maybe not our personal sin, but our sin as a nation has corrupted our nation. Just like it did in the days of Micah. And God still brings salvation through judgment. God still brings hope in the midst of our darkest days. That's why, even though Micah's message is not one of feel good, it still brings hope to all of us who believe. Thank you for joining us for worship today. I hope and pray that God has challenged or inspired you through this message. And if he has, please leave a comment or send us an email and let us know. Also, you could do those same things to let us know if there's any prayer requests you have that we could join you in prayer for. Thank you again for watching. Hope to see you again soon. God bless you.